We're gonna go ahead and read our scripture for today. So if you don't mind standing for the reading of the word of the Lord, we're reading Revelation 5. Then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And behold, one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and a golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads of thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and amen. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Go ahead and have a seat, please. Thank you, band. Um, I don't know if you guys caught it. And this is, this is kind of cool. Um, Nathaniel, my guy. This guy over here that's tripping over the cords now. This young man started in our youth group forever ago, and he's smarter than anybody I know, one of the smartest people on the planet, working over at Lockheed Martin. But then he started playing keys for youth and leader in youth, keys for us. Today he led his first song with great inside faithfulness, and, he did, and he's, kill, he's hating me right now, but young man, we're so proud of you. I know mom and dad, their mom and dad are giving you hugs and high fives. Good job, buddy. Um, that's, that's, that's really awesome. Um, if you have your Bibles, flip with me over to Revelation chapter 5 or your notebooks. By the way, when you come in every Sunday, just as a reminder what's going on, the notebooks um, are there. You've got papers to follow along. So if you're a visitor and this is your first time and you're getting these papers, please, on your way downstairs today, you can get a notebook and just walk with us as we walk through the entire book of Revelation. I know I got in trouble last week. Several Connect Group leaders called me and they're wondering, hey, why didn't you talk about the seven... Um, aspects of the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. You mentioned it, but didn't read it or, or didn't list them, but they were in your notebooks, people. So open up your notebooks. There's things that I, I, I just apologize. There are things that I've got to pass on when I'm going through my sermon. Like we're going to be here till 1230 if I don't skip some stuff. So if I skip stuff, look to your notebooks first, then send your angry emails to Zach. Okay. And he, he will take care of all that jazz. Everybody doing well? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Awesome. Um, one of the things, I've got so many physical ailments, it's ridiculous. At times, it's almost comical, um, just some of the things. One of the funny things that you might not know, because my feet are covered with glorious sneakers every single week, is I have chronic ingrown toenails. Anybody else struggle with that? It's horrible, right? It's horrible. Mine is it's a punishment for running, and so I run a lot. I hate running, but I run so I can eat real food, and so I do all that. But with that comes chronic um, ingrown toenails, and over the last two years, um, I've had one toenail that just keeps growing back inappropriately, where it got yanked off two years ago, and in replacement of that one ingrown toenail, I got three ingrown toenails, all on one toe, three toenails, layer upon layer upon layer. And a couple weeks ago, I thought I was down to one toe, toenail, not one toe, <laughs> one, one, one toenail. 
I thought I was down to one toenail. And so I went into my foot doctor. My foot doctor is a believer. I love this lady's incredible. And um, she's like, okay, I, I brought my toe. I brought my whole body in with my toe. And I said, I'm pretty sure I have an abscess. I've had those before because I don't know about you. I try to resolve the problem before going to the doctor. So I pick at it and try to make it. That's, don't do that. I, I've been yelled at by every foot doctor ever. Don't do that. Makes it worse as a chiropractor. He doesn't, me, Dr. Roberts doesn't want me cracking my own back. Go to him. Go to the pros. Let them do it. But I pick at my toes, and I made it worse. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's turned into an abscess. She looks at my toes. She's like, it's not an abscess. I'm like, well, what is it? She's like, you don't want to know. Just turn your head. And I, I turned my head, and she took pliers, like foot doctor pliers, and um, I, I had a toenail growing in sideways, and she peeled it off. Um, and I was like, I'm like, whoo! And then when it was done, I was like, ah. Oh. It, was, it was incredible. And the reason I bring you, I, I just wanted to share that story. No, nothing to do, no, there, there's a point to this story. There, there's a point to the story. And this point of the story is my toe is the mark of the beast. And so it's just that ugly. Um, she brought it up. She, she knows that I'm a pastor and she's a Christian. She goes to a different church. She's like, what are you preaching on right now? And I'm like, Revelation. We're, we're walking through the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, one of the most misunderstood books in the entire Bible. And she goes, and this is a typical response when people People know that we're going through the book of Revelation. She said, um, literally, she said, okay, perfect timing for the book of Revelation with everything that's going on in our culture right now. And I think every generation, okay, so I heard this in the 70s, eight, I don't remember in the 70s, I was just a little guy in the 70s, but in the 80s, 90s, you hear this all the time. Of course, this is the book of Revelation being lived out in our generation right now. We look outside, it's like, okay, it's all this, this stuff going on. And she's like, it's scary times and all this. And it opened up a door an incredible door where all of a sudden I'm like, okay, I get that. I understand why I could receive it that way or understand it this way. But did you know the book of Revelation is actually encouragement that it's not intended to scare you. It's not intended to bring fear or induce fear in the believer, but allow us to understand that things are not as they seem. And that's the backbone, that's the heartbeat of this entire book, is that things are not as they seem. We look at our culture, especially for us, our generation right now is everything since 2020 to now, everything that happened with the pandemic and the turmoil, poverty, racial tension, school shootings, just all the evil that's in the world. And we look out and we're going, man, Satan's winning. Like, who really is on the throne? Sometimes we question maybe, hey, has somebody tied God up and thrown him in an attic? Like, where is he in all of this? And what Revelation has done and what we're looking at in Revelation 4 and 5 is that we're specifically called to put on these spiritual glasses, which is the book of Revelation. And as we put on our spiritual glasses, we're able to see that things are not as they seem. So the first time you guys that wear glasses, you put glasses on for the first time, you could see a new reality, that reality is different than what you thought. The same is true with these spiritual glasses in the book of Revelation, that there is one who's sitting on the throne. He was, he is, he is to come sitting on the throne. He hasn't given up his throne. He's not playing king of the hill where he's being knocked off on Mondays and he comes back on Sundays. He's always been, always will be on the throne. And that's the good news of the book of Revelation. That's, that, that's the baseline for everything we're going to talk about. Now, it's interesting. The first three chapters, we're four months. We're finishing the fourth month of this series and we're through four chapters. This sucker could take a while, right? This could take a while. So we're through four chapters, but the first three chapters were really, really intentional. The front end of the book of Revelation at the, at the very beginning, chapter one is all about Jesus. It's illuminating, revealing who Jesus is. Revelation means peeling back, unveiling what is real so you know what is true. Then in Revelation chapter two and three, we get these letters to these seven churches where Jesus is giving instruction to his churches. So in chapters one through three, what's being done here, so you understand this, is a foundation is being laid of God's sovereignty. God is saying, I am in control. Nobody else is in control. It might look that I've lost control. I haven't. I know what's up. We just sang it. What the enemy meant for evil, God will use all things for his glory, for his good. There is not one thing in this world that hasn't at least gone across his desk for permission first. He's in absolute control. And this is really, really important as we walk into chapter four and through the rest of Revelation. Because can we, can we be honest? From chapter four onward, things get weird. Like really weird. Weird, And this is the stuff in the book of Revelation where most of us are scared of. We're like, I don't know what that means. Like there's locust and there's Armageddon and there's apocalypse and there's, are, are there zombies? I mean, we're, we're asking all these questions about the book of Revelation. It's from the chapter four onward that we get that. Now here's why chapters one through three are so important. If we don't have this foundation that God is sovereign, if we don't understand that he is absolutely in control and that he sits on his throne, 
then we're going to be scared to death when we read chapters four and on. But if we know that there is one that sits on the throne and he's almighty and he rules and he will never lose his throne, then there's purpose in chapters four and onwards. Does that make sense? So as we get into the weird stuff, don't freak out, okay? Do I find the weird stuff weird? Yeah, it is weird stuff, especially to a Western 21st century mindset. And we're going back to a first century apocalyptic literature. It's totally different. So we need to read it through that. So now we're being introduced to chapters four and five. And I want you to understand something. We're in the second window. There's five windows that John is allowed to see into. This is window number two. And chapters four and five go together. These are two chapters that go together. What we're gonna find in chapters four and five is this throne room. Jesus has invited John, the apostle John, into heaven to get a glimpse of heaven in the future so he can see what's going on currently and in the future in this throne room. And so he's invited into this place that we've never been. But this is a reality. This is a real thing. And he sees some amazing things. Now, what I want us to notice is chapter four is all about one thing. It's about God. It's about the worship of God for who he is. Chapter five is now going to turn out to be worship of Jesus for what he has done. Understand this, when we worship, when we sing these songs every Sunday or when you worship in your car, you live your life as a living testimony, you're living sacrifice of worship. Worship is nothing more than a response. It's a response to God for who he is and what he has done, okay? Those of you guys that have a spouse, you love your spouse for two reasons. Hopefully, Hopefully you love your spouse, okay? I encourage you, to love your spouse. That's my marital advice to you. Love your spouse, okay? There's two reasons you love your spouse. Number one, for who they are, and number two, for what they do. And so the same thing is true with God. We worship him for these two reasons. Chapter four is all about we worship God for who he is. Chapter five is we worship Jesus for what he has done. So we've already walked into chapter four, right? We've, we've talked about chapter four. In chapter four, John walks into this throne room. Immediately, he sees the throne. The throne is occupied, which at that point, if you were a charismatic church, we, like we got mixtures, we got everybody from all, all creeds in here right now. But if you're a charismatic, you'd be like, we'd all be good with Zenobia. We'd all be shouting when we realize, hey, there's somebody on the throne. The throne is not vacant. The throne is not empty. And this is the first thing that John recognizes. There's thunder and lightning in this throne room. There's a rainbow, all of this weird stuff. But this declaration of the thunder and lightning is saying, God's flexing. It's just just God going, I'm him. I'm the guy. There there is no other him. It It is just me. And he's flexing, I am almighty, I am holy, I am righteous, I am sovereign. And John's just humbled by that. Then he looks around the room and things get weird, right? Okay, cool, throne. But why, why are there 24 more thrones around your throne? And, and there's some dudes on those thrones, and those dudes are wearing white garments and golden crowns. What's going on? He says, those are the 24 elders. We talked about this last week. Remember who the 24 elders are. Most scholars believe the 24 elders are a combination of 12 people. F- I just did that. 12, 12 people from the Old Testament, from the tribe of Judah, or from the tribe of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel are represented there. And then the 12 apostles, Jesus is 12 apostles. So 12 plus 12 equals a complete 24. 12 hours in the morning, 12 hours in the afternoon, a complete 24-hour day. So 12 people from the Old Testament, 12 people from the New Testament, meaning the whole company of all saints, past and present and future, are around this throne, laying their crowns at his feet. And then there's these four creatures. This is where it gets weird. Four, okay, I get it, 24 elders, cool. They're around the throne. But what are these four living creatures? One looks like an ox, right? We got an eagle, we got man. We got, we got these weird, this lion figure, and they've got eyeballs all around, and they're leading in worship. What's going on with this? And these are a symbol of all of God's creation, worshiping God around his throne. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back, listen to last week's message. It, it's all in there. So this is happening. This is what's happening around the throne. They're worshiping God for who he is. Now we're jumping into chapter five and the tone changes and it changes drastically. We're gonna go from worshiping God for who he is to worshiping Jesus for what he has done. So let's jump into this. In Revelation chapter five, Laura um, came up here between songs and she already read this whole thing, but we're gonna break it down. This is cool stuff. I'm hoping, I'm hoping this comes out right. If it doesn't, it's on me, but this is incredible stuff. So starting in chapter five, verse one, this is what John sees. Then I saw in the right hand of him, talking about right hand of the father. Remember the right hand is the strong, mighty, undefeatable hand of God. I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within 
and on the back, sealed with seven seals. At which point, when we get to our devotions and we get to the book of Revelation, this is where we check out. We're like, okay, there's a dude and he's holding a scroll and it's sealed and it's got words on it. I have no idea what that means. Let's bounce, right? Anybody, this is, this is where you're like, ah, I can't, I, I get the letters to the churches. I get the throne room. What in the world's going on? So let's paint a picture. Imagine that you're the apostle John. Jesus has invited you into heaven. And, and before you see your mansion or the streets of gold or you, you see your deceased loved ones, the very first thing you see is this throne room. Like you are in the holy of holies. You are in the presence of of God, and you, so you see the throne, you see God sitting on the throne, you see the 24 elders around the throne, you see the four living creatures, there's thunder, there's lightning, there's rainbows. It's overwhelming to all your senses, just absolutely overwhelming to your senses. Then everything starts getting into focus. All of a sudden you calm down, your heart slows down for a minute, you're like, okay, let's chill, what, what's going on? And you look at the one on the throne, and you notice that in his right hand there's something going on. What, what's, what's that in his right hand? And you notice it's a scroll. You're like, it's a scroll, but not only is that a scroll, but there are so many words on it that the words are inside and outside. So every, have you ever, remember when in, in school when you get to take an open book test or an open note test, but you only got like one piece of paper? And so you crammed everything you could on that piece of paper? This is what that scroll looks like. There's words everywhere in this scroll, and the scroll is sealed with seven seals. Seven seals, not like ur, ur, seals, but like, like locks, okay? It's locked on there. It, it can't be opened. Now, seven, again, is the number of completeness. Perfect. It's perfectly sealed. It cannot be opened. Why are there words everywhere on this thing? Most scholars believe what this scroll represents. We'll talk about the Lamb's Book of Life later. That's not it. Right now, what this scroll is, is the perfect will of God for the future. This is God's plan. What, what's going to take place? What's going to happen with God's redemptive purposes in the world? And this scroll has to be unlocked in order for these plans to take place. Remember, it's with God's words that things come into existence. So these words are on a scroll, but these words need to be released. And they're everywhere. There's so many of these words that they're inside the scroll, they're outside the scroll, they're everywhere, the plan of God, and it's a good thing. So everyone around the throne, and we'll find out that it's not just the 24 elders and the four living creatures, it's now John. They're looking at that scroll and they're probably thinking, open it, what's in it? Make it take place, let God's kingdom come. Unleash that scroll, unleash that scroll. So that's what's going on in this very first verse. Now check this out, verse two. And then, this is John speaking, I saw a mighty angel, this is probably Gabriel, can't prove it. We're just going to go with Gabriel because every time there's an important message, it's typically Gabriel. So I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Now imagine how loud this voice is. We'll bring it to life in a minute, but just imagine how loud this voice is. And he says this, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I, John, I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Notice that's a lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. This is incredible. Here's what's going on. Okay, so he notices there's a scroll in God's right hand that is the perfect will of God for all redemptive purposes in the future unlock that thing. So God sends a messenger to proclaim to the entire cosmos. It says, on earth, under the earth, everywhere, Gabriel or whoever this angel is pronounces this, this, this message, hey, is there anybody worthy to open this scroll? If so, come forward. Imagine that powerful voice. Imagine hearing that out of nowhere. All of a sudden, there's this voice that everybody can hear. How many of you guys, a couple weeks ago, got a text Alert, well, not an alert, uh, uh, this welcome thing from the state of Florida at 4.45 a.m. Anybody? So if you have an iPhone, there's a really good chance in central Florida at 4.45 a.m. you got woken up by the emergency system that was testing their system. That software company has been fired. Praise God, they should be. They will, I, I don't know about you, 4.45 is not my peak hour. They're like, I am not good at 4.45, but they had my attention. If Gabriel is so loud or this angel is so loud that everything on earth, under the earth, around the earth can hear him, you have my attention. 
And his declaration is, is there anybody that can open this scroll? We really need this scroll unlocked. Now, now, around that throne are what? How many elders? 24. 12 of them are from the Old Testament, the tribes of Israel. 12 of them are who? The other 12 are the apostles. Are, is there an apostle? Is there one of the 12 apostles that when a question is asked and silence is given, he typically steps up to the plate and puts his foot in the mouth? Anybody? Peter. At this point, I'm imagining Peter going, I'll give it a shot, right? I can take the sword out of the rock. I can open the seal. We don't know. It's not in the Bible. I bet, I bet Peter took a shot. I'm sure Peter took a shot. Nobody was found worthy to open the scroll. Everybody failed. Everybody failed. But the announcement goes out, hey, is there anybody in here can open the scroll? Nobody can open the scroll. If the scroll isn't open, God's redemptive purposes for the future will not unpack. This is terrible, terrible news. To the point where John sees this, he's like, no, 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 no. This isn't good. And it says, what does it say John does? How does he respond when he finds out that the scroll can't be opened? He weeps. He loses it. He's an emotional wreck. He's like, no, this scroll must be opened. What happens? As he's weeping, one of the 24 elders comes over and taps him on the shoulder. Which one of the 24 elders do you think tapped him on the shoulder? I've got some guesses. I can't wait to find out. I had a guess, and Melanie ruined my guess. I guess that it was Peter, because Peter and John have this competition, right? As you read through the Gospel of John, Peter and John are racing to the tomb, and John makes sure he knows, hey, I'm faster than Peter. P Peter's pretty cool. He's strong, but he's an idiot, and, and I'm faster. He's stronger. We've got this competition going. John's before the throne weeping because the scroll can't be open. Can you imagine Peter going, hey, bro, the scroll can be open? I mean, like they come together. That'd be awesome. But remember, this is happening in the future. This is where Melanie popped my bubble. It's like, oh my gosh, I didn't think of this. I don't know if this is true, but imagine if it's John from the future tapping John from the present on the shoulder saying, hey dude, look what's gonna happen. Like back to the future type, Marty McFly type stuff. That's awesome, right? Can you imagine, and Melanie and I were talking about this yesterday and I, I got emotional about it. I'm thinking about it. I'm like, can you imagine your future self standing before Jesus knowing the full plan of God being able to come back to your present self and say, hey, look at the throne. He's got it, man. Stop worrying. Stop freaking out. Stop living in anxiety and nervousness. He's got it. So whoever it was, an elder taps him on the shoulder and says, look, look at the lion of Judah. Look at the, and this is a reference to Jesus, the lion of Judah. And he, he calls him out as the lion of Judah. So this is what happens when this, this takes place. Go back with me to verse 6. So he's pointing out, this elder's pointing out, John, stop crying. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, verse six, and between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw, what did he see? A lamb or a lion? What did he see? Because Peter or John or whoever taps him on the shoulders, like, look, 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 the lion, the tribe of Judah. And then it says here in verse six, and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes. That's weird, because we're talking about Jesus. Does Jesus have horns and seven eyeballs? I mean, that's weird. Again, we're talking about imagery, first century apocalyptic literature imagery, seven, the complete number. So he has seven horns, all powerful. He has seven eyes, all wisdom. He sees everything. So this is what this means in that. It doesn't mean that Jesus is walking around with horns extending from everywhere. It, it just means that he's all seeing, all knowing, all powerful but I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, seven being the perfect one Holy Spirit of God sent out into all the earth. So John is presented to the one who is worthy to open the scroll. The elder taps him on the shoulder, look at the lion. And when John turns up to look, he doesn't see a lion. He sees a lamb. And not only does he see a lamb, he sees a mutilated, slaughtered lamb. He doesn't see a roaring lion. He sees a crushed lamb. What in the world is going on? Is Jesus a lion or is Jesus a crushed lamb? Yes, he's both. He is the lion 
and the lamb. Now, this, this imagery, this statement is really, really incredible. Here's the key to the entire text, and here's what I want you to understand. The elder who told John not to weep any longer, for there is one who's worthy and capable of unsealing the scroll, reveals to Jesus to John as a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, here, here's what we need to know. A lion is powerful. We're thinking the one who can unseal that scroll, the one who can release God's destiny and God's redemptive plans on the earth has to be a lion. Like, like we, I mean, they're the king of the jungle. They're strong, they're mighty, they're victorious. They're, they're Simba, they're Mufasa, they're Aslan, right? From Chronicles of Narnia. This is who is going to do this. This is who is the mighty one sitting on the throne. This is him. And when John looks, he discovers it's not the lion that opens the seal. It's the crushed lamb that opens the seal. The seal is open because the lion was slaughtered. Not because of powerful might, not because he was strong, not because he led a big army, not because he had sword and spear, but because he died. It was open. I was like, what, what do we do with that? Imagine walking into that room, into the throne room, and going, there's one in this room. We don't know who it is right off the bat. I'll let you figure it out. Let's play the game. We're in the throne room. That scroll needs to be opened, and there's only one person in here who is qualified to open it. Look around the room. Who is it? And you're looking at the 24 elders. Is it any of them? I mean, look at their clothes. Look at their crowns. They've, they're strong. They're powerful. They're leaders. So they should be able to open it, certainly. Nope. None of them. Okay. One of the four living creatures, one that looks like a lion, one that looks like an ox, one that looks like a man, one that looks like an eagle. They've got eyeballs and wings, and they're weird. They've got a, Nope. Not them either. Okay. What about this one that I can't... Is it a lion? Or is it a lion? the lion, and then right next to the throne, there's this lamb, and, and, and I, I'm a butcher's son. I'm, I, I've seen some gross things, and I think sometimes when we think about the sacrificial system of the Old Testament laws and temple dedications and all of that stuff going on, or we think about even the crucifixion of Jesus, we're like, okay, it, it was kind of pleasant. Like, yeah, the little lamb, he had to die. No, the little lamb got slaughtered, and it was messy. And the high priest is covered in guts and blood. And so next to the throne, there's a lamb that is mutilated. Your last guess, because of how you were raised and because of the kingdoms of this world, would be that that is the key to unlocking the scroll. He's not strong. He's defeated. He's crushed. That looks like he lost. There's no way he's qualified to open the scroll. But Peter's like, look, or the elder is like, look, 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 look. What was a lion in order to open the scroll became not only a lamb, but willingly became a slaughtered lamb. So that scroll can be opened. Later on, when Jesus walks in in Revelation on the back of a stallion, notice what he comes in as. Because in here is the key to unlocking everything about our lives is that Jesus didn't open the scroll as a lion. He opened it as a lamb. Verse six, between the throne and the four living creatures and around the throne among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. The only one worthy and capable of opening the sealed will of God is Jesus. And he's worthy because he was slain. That's what made him worthy to do this. Now this picture is incredible. And the one revealed to be worthy is the one who has been crushed. So Bruce Metzger says this, he said, of, he said this, instead of a ferocious lion that hurts others, the Messiah is a sacrificial lamb that takes into himself the hurts of others. Now this term, lamb of God, in the New Testament, you're only gonna hear one author called Jesus the lamb of God, and it's John. You'll see it in the book of Revelation 28 times. You'll see it in the Gospel of John. These are the only two places in the entire New Testament where Jesus is called the Lamb of God. John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus coming, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He doesn't say, hey, behold, the Lion of Judah who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God who takes the sins of the world. In the Old Testament, the spotless lamb was the one that was sacrificed. This is why Pastor Laura, when she gave the announcement for why we give, we give out of an act of worship, giving God our first and our best. This is from the Jewish Old Testament principle of giving God not just an offering, but giving him your first and giving him your best. So you'd give him a spotless lamb, and that lamb would be slaughtered for the sins of the people. 
at the first Passover, a Pascal lamb was sacrificed, and John references this lamb several times in the Passion Week account. In the first century, in apocalyptic literature, outside extra-biblical literature, they often referenced a lamb as a victorious, mighty conqueror. This was a warrior lamb, which is kind of funny, right? Lambs don't seem like Ah, but, but there was this warrior lamb, but the Bible presents the lamb of God as a sacrificial, crushed, sacrificed lamb, totally upside down. The kingdom of God is the right side up kingdom. And what's going on here, and so you know with the seven horns and the seven eyes, God is saying, listen, the sacrificial lamb, Jesus being crushed, Jesus unlocking locking the scroll, this isn't a mistake. All powerful, all knowing, all wisdom, this was on purpose. Jesus didn't accidentally come to earth and die for your sins. He intentionally did that, which is an incredible statement to all of us. If we don't feel loved, if we feel like nobody on this planet loves us, we can always look and say, wait, 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 the lion of the tribe of Judah became a sacrificial lamb for me and for my sins, and it wasn't a mistake. He didn't accidentally end up on the cross. He intentionally ended up there. John Piper says it like this. Gotta love some Piper. Piper says this. The lion of Judah, <laughs> Judah, the lion of Judah conquered because he was willing to act the part of a lamb. He came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday like a king on the way to a throne, and he went out of Jerusalem on Good Friday like a lamb on the way to the slaughter. He drove out the robbers from the temple like a lion devouring its prey, and then at the end of the week, he gave his majestic neck to the knife, and they slaughtered the lion of Judah like a lamb. So he conquered sin and death and Satan, not just because he was a lion, but because he was a lamb-like lion. The lion gets the victory through the tactics of the lamb. Continues. Now, how, what happens? John's now seeing this. He's been pointed to the throne. Oh my gosh, the one that opens the scroll. And believe me, John, who was at the sacrifice? Go back with me to Good Friday, and who's at the foot of the cross? John and Mary were there. John saw the slaughter firsthand. He knows what took place. Now look what heaven responds in when they realize there is one to open the scroll, which when we sing our songs, we're like, praise God, somebody can open the scroll. If that scroll's not open, you and I, we're hosed, right? But because the scroll is open by the blood of the lamb, we have entrance into the kingdom of God, into the, into the kingdom of heaven. Our eternities are secure because of this lamb. So how do we respond? This is how heaven responds. Verse seven. So Jesus, this lamb, goes and takes the scroll from the right hand of him who is seated on the throne. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, which by the way is the answer to Mercy Me's question. I can only imagine, will I stand or will I fall? You will fall in the face of Almighty God. You, you won't stay there forever, but I guarantee your first response in the face of Almighty God is going to be on your knees. The 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp, that's weird, musical instrument and praise and worship, and then golden bowls full of incense. Huh? So think about this. The elders are bowing down, the 24, the 24 elders bowing down, casting their crowns. Over here, you got the four living creatures, those weird creatures, and they're bowing down, and they're offering up their harps, and they're offering up the bowls of incense, which then the next line says, which are the prayers of the saints. We sing a song and we'll finish it today, finish our service today with this song, worthy of, it, worthy, worthy of It All. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from him are all things and to him. You know what I'm talking about? And then there's a bridge, day and night, night and day. Let incense arise. And whenever we sang that song, I'm like, I, I'm begging our worship leaders, please explain that. Because to the first person that, or if you're new here and you're reading our lyrics, you're going, huh? Night and day, and day and night. Let in, now, now, Catholics, you guys get that. Episcopalians, you guys get that. Us non-denom people, we don't get that. Let incense arise? W what the heck? And what we find in Revelation 5 is the incense is the prayer of the saints. So these elders and these, 20, or these four living creatures are bowing before God, knowing that he can open the scroll, knowing that he redeems all mankind, that he has the answers to everything. And they're like, here's the prayers of your people. Here's your prayers. Every single prayer that you have ever prayed or will pray is reaching the throne of heaven because the lamb sacrificed his life to open that scroll. That's what's going on. So your prayers are heard. Your prayers are received. So there's golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, verse nine, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals for you were slain. And by your blood, you ran, not by your roar, 
not by your crown, not by your weapons, but by your blood. You ransom people for God from every tribe, every language, every people, every nation, and you have made a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Now, here, this is awesome. This is the fulfillment of the Great Commission. This, this is incredible. Around the throne, they're singing this song. Hey, you are worthy of it all, man. I'm not man, God. Like, what? And you have made every tribe, every nation, every language a priesthood for you, fulfilling the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lo, I am behold, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is showing us that the Great Commission is fulfilled. There's people from every tribe, every language around this throne singing this song. Now, in, in chapter four, the songs of the angels, the songs of those gathered around the throne were songs of worship to God the Father. You remember the songs of chapter four? We sing them all the time. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's chapter four. Chapter five, the song sings, or the song changes. Jesus, Lamb of God, slaughtered Lamb of God, you're worthy of it all. It's all yours. Look at how he continues, verse 11. Then I looked and I heard the throne. I heard around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, the voice of many angels. Where'd they come from? He keeps looking and the more he looks, the more heaven just keeps growing. It started with 24 elders and a throne. Then there's four weird creatures. Now he looks around and there's billions of angels everywhere, numbering myriads of myriads, thousands upon thousands, saying with a loud voice, notice the song changes. It was holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Now the song changes. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To which... A rational soul should be like, how do I give him those things? Those aren't attributes that we're assigning to Jesus. Those are attributes that Jesus already has that we're acknowledging. How many attributes were just listed? Seven. Complete praise was going to Jesus. Power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, blessing. Complete praise all to the lamb that was slain. And then one final song. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, amen. This was a night of worship that was lit. This thing was incredible. And this is what we participate on every Lord's Day when we come together. We gather around the throne with the 24 elders and the four living creatures and billions of angels and we sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come, but also worthy are you, Jesus, because you opened the seal and you didn't do it by flexing. You did it by laying down your life and becoming the slain son of God. And it says here in verse 13 that in this moment, all of creation, heaven and earth, is singing these praises. This is a confirmation of Romans chapter eight where it says that all of creation is groaning for the return of Jesus. All of creation is probably bitter at mankind for messing everything up, but they sure do praise Jesus for fixing our mess. Then finally, verse 14, the four living creatures said, amen. We know what amen means by now, right? Let it be truth. Amen, amen, I declare this is true. So Jesus is probably like, thank you for living creatures for affirming that is true. Even if you didn't affirm that it was true, it's still true, but thank you for living creatures, well done. It's true, it's true. Five quick points and then I'm done. These five points, you're like, what, five points? You're just starting your points? That was your introduction? Nope, 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 this is my conclusion. This vision of heaven gives us a clear vision on earth, and I stole these from um, Eugene Peterson. So this is out of his book um, on Revelation. This vision of heaven gives us a clear vision on earth. Five things that we can see here on earth because we got a picture of heaven, okay? Number one, at the center of reality is one who suffers. We need to understand first and foremost that our king empathizes with us in our suffering. The prosperity gospel, which I, I am bound and determined by the end of my life, to preach that the prosperity gospel is nothing but hogwash. And it is the exact opposite of the gospel. You follow Jesus, you will be wealthy and rich and never suffer. The invitation of the New Testament constantly, Paul's epistles and Jesus' invitation to us is lay down your cross or pick up your cross. Don't lay down your cross. Pick up your cross, follow me. Those who suffer understand Jesus' plight. Jesus understands our plight because he suffered first. So suffering is part of our story. 
It's part of what the world will look at us and say there's something different about them because of how they're handling suffering. They have peace, they have joy, they have resiliency in the midst of suffering. That's because our king, the lamb, suffered first. There's an old African-American spiritual that my dad used to sing, and I didn't know that it was an African-American spiritual until I got older, and you've heard it before. Nobody knows. The trouble I've seen, nobody knows but Jesus. Isn't that true? Like, this, Jesus knows our suffering. He understands it. So when we're walking through hell on earth, understand first and foremost that the slaughtered lamb of God understands that as well. And this is not the end of the story. Things are not as they seem. Number two, the second thing that we see as we look into heaven and what, how it relates to us here on earth is that the center of reality is grace. Grace. And I'm not talking about cheap Grace. Cheap grace is this grace that says, hey, I signed up on the bottom line. One time the pastor said a prayer and I raised my hand and I repeated after him. And then I got the get out of hell free card for the rest of my life, so I'm good. That's, that's cheap grace. I can live whatever way I want. I can do whatever I want. I don't need to be a part of a church community. I, I've, got the, I've got the card. That's cheap grace. That's spitting on the grace of God. Costly grace says it costs God everything. It costs Jesus everything. You understand this. The lamb goes to the cross because of you. The lamb goes to the cross because of you. He goes to the cross for you, and he goes to the cross instead of you. Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on this lamb, this other sheep. This, the, instead of king of kings and lord of lords, this is the lamb of lambs. This is like the lamb. He put on him the iniquity of us all. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake he made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Then the 80s chorus, I'm not gonna sing it. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. So as we look into heaven, we understand that he suffers, we suffer. We also understand his grace better when we see what he's done for us. Number three, we work from victory. We understand that we work from victory, not towards it. Our works-oriented righteousness is filthy rags before our God. We cannot earn our relationship with him any more than Haley and Caden can earn their do-forwardness by doing the lawn or doing the laundry today. They do the laundry, kind of. Well, they do the laundry. They do the lawn because they're my kids. We learn or we walk from a place of victory. We're not trying to earn the victory. The slaughtered lamb earned the victory. Now walk in it. This is who you are. Number four, the way to fullness of life is the way of the lamb. You're not gonna like this one. The way to live a fulfilled, complete, incredible life. And you're like, well, it's to conquer. It's to get more stuff. It's to win. But the way of the lamb is like, no, nah, sir. Flip that. It's not to win, it's to serve. It's not to live, it's to die. This is the way of the lamb. The lamb is not weak, the lamb is not stupid. The lamb is all powerful and all knowing. He knows what's best for you. So we're out there as Christians going, you know the way, the way of God? The, the way of God is we gotta win, we gotta conquer, we gotta do this, we gotta, our guy has to win, our political party has to win, we've gotta win. And Jesus is like, no, you have to sacrifice. Don't give up truth. You need to lay your life down. There's got to be something different about you, and it shouldn't be something annoying. It should be something attractive to this world that says there's something different about them. The way of the lamb is the way of fullness of life. And then number five, the final one. History is heading towards the feet of the lamb. Ultimately, every single one of us is going to be at the feet of the lamb. Whether you decided to follow Jesus or not, all of us one day will bow to the feet of the lamb. And as I said last week, my prayer for all of us in this room is that we bow our knee prior, prior to our homecoming, prior to our death, prior to Jesus coming back. We accept Jesus as Lord and Savior on this side of eternity, not when we're forced to in this moment. This means that when the lamb unseals the scroll, we will discover that everything, good and evil, ultimately serves God's purposes. We can never lose choosing to follow in Christ's weak and foolish ways. We do not fulfill God's plan by conquering we do so by sacrificial service. Psalm 37, the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. We were singing a song earlier. It's a song I wrestle with. It's a song that these guys kept begging me 
to play. I don't even remember if it was you guys. I think it was Sharla that actually first started. We used to sing it, but I'm gonna see a victory. And, and the reason that song, and it, we, we sang it today because it's true. It is a good song, but we gotta understand what victory means. Victory doesn't mean I'm gonna get my way in everything here on planet Earth. It means God's plans are going to be fulfilled in my life. Now, if there's addiction, if there's struggles, like who better to turn to to get that victory than the one who laid down his life for you in those struggles? I wanna read a poem as we conclude today and we'll be done. And it's just a comparison of Jesus as the lion and Jesus as the lamb. Is Jesus the lion? Yep. Is Jesus the lamb that was slaughtered and crushed for your sin? Yep. And that's what makes it beautiful. This wasn't just a random lamb that was selected. This was the lion of God chosen to be the slaughtered Pascal lamb for your sin. Don't don't ever take that for granted. That's insane. Who does that? And he did it for a traitor race, people who turned their back on him. This is who our king is. So hear these words and I'll be done. And this is by, I always forget his name, Sam Storms wrote this. The lion in whom we find unimpeachable authority is also the lamb who embodies humility and meekness in the highest degree. The lion who wields power and strength that none can resist is also the lamb who walked this earth in weakness and suffering, resisting none. The lion who rules the world and governs its every move is also the lamb who was meekly led to slaughter by his enemies. The lion who is known for his uncompromising commitment to righteousness is also the lamb who overflows in love for sinners like you and me. The lion who commands total obedience from everyone is also the lamb who in his earthly life submitted himself in obedience to the law of God. The lion who is holy and pure beyond our wildest imagination is also the lamb who is gracious and kind and tender-hearted to all. The lion who could silence a raging storm with a single word is also the lamb who refused to speak or revile against those who nailed him to the cross. The lion who is life itself is also the lamb who willingly dies for his enemies. The lion who is exalted high above the heavens, immeasurably beyond all of creation and myriads of angels, before whom the greatest and most powerful kings and commanders on earth are but a speck of dust on the balance, is also the lamb who stooped low, who condescended to become one of us and suffer the trials of challenges put on him by weak and sinful men. The lion who is himself infinite holiness and righteousness and purity and power is also the lamb who welcomes broken sinners into his presence and makes intimate friends of his enemies. The lion who in himself needs nothing, being altogether self-sufficient, is also the lamb who gives and gives and then gives yet again so generously and abundantly. The lion who is known for his majesty is also the lamb who is known for his meekness. The lion who commands absolute obedience from his creatures is also the lamb who is obedient, whose obedience honored every command of his father. And finally, the lion who rightly burns with wrath against the rebellious and unbelieving is also the lamb who in the place of these rebellious and unbelieving endured in his own body and soul the very wrath we deserved. Let's pray. There's one that's worthy to open the scroll. I can't do it. You can't do it. Pastor, priest, rabbi, pope, we can't do it. There's one. And the way of that scroll being opened was the sacrificial love of his life. And he did that for you. This morning, I'm gonna invite right now, I'm gonna invite our elders who are our elder on call and then Gary and Patsy, they're gonna come forward and they're gonna stand on either side. If you need prayer for anything this morning, I'm gonna invite you in just a moment. As I'm praying, I'm gonna invite you to come on up. Don't be ashamed, don't be afraid. If you, if you need Jesus, if there's stuff going on in your life you need prayer for, I'm gonna invite you during this song, during this prayer to come on up. God, I pray in Jesus' name that this morning you would allow us to see what John saw. Here in Revelation chapter five as we're welcomed into the throne room. Let us, let us see, allow us see, to see what is real, what is really real. That behind the chaos of this world, the destruction, the evil of this world, we have a God who is not shaken. We have a God who has won the battle, who, who victory is in his hands. And that one day you will put an end to all of this and new life will begin. 
So right now, in the midst of this chaotic world, we trust you. We lay our lives before you. I pray that we would put down our titles and our swords and our ways of conquering and we would look at the right side up kingdom and become people of the cross. We'd understand what it means to suffer well. We would understand what it means to serve and lay down our lives for others. Let us be the church you've called us to be. Let us be the people you've called us to be. Holy Father on the throne, we cry out to you today, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come for who you are. And Jesus, the slaughtered lamb of God, we look at you and we say, worthy are you to be praised. With glory and honor and power and might, we worship you. We thank you that we have freedom and we have grace in you today. We have redemption, we have the forgiveness of sins because of you. We love you today, it's in Christ's name we all pray, amen.